Wait, it's recording. All right, so we'll give people just a couple minutes to arrive. It looks like people are, are coming in right now. All right, so we're just waiting maybe another minute or two just for everybody to, to kind of get into the program. All right, so I think we'll go ahead and get started with, um, with an introduction. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. We're very excited uh, to have these three artists here and to be able to host this Zoom discussion. Um, I'm here on Tiwa lands and I do want to honor the indigenous peoples of this place um, in Turtle Island and also throughout the world. Um, I'm Michelle Lantieri. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions here at the Millicent Rogers Museum in Taos, New Mexico. Uh, really excited to be with you all tonight. Um, so this program is part of our current exhibition, which is a partnership with the Institute of American Indian Arts Artists in Residence Program. And the name of the exhibition is New Mexico Air, IAIA Artist Residence in Visual Dialogue. Uh, and so it's on view uh, now through January 29th of next year. And so the premise of the exhibition is that the artists who are participating, they're based in New Mexico and they've participated in the AIR program. Uh, so we're working with 10 different artists for this show. Um, and each artist is focusing on different aspects of home, identity construction, um, and also cross-cultural exchange. Um, so tonight we're gonna go ahead and start with um, introducing the artists uh, with their bios. Um, and then we'll go into kind of a roundtable format where we can hear a lot more about their practices um, kind of in certain ways related to illustration and the figure and also animation and comics. Um, I did also want to ask that if you have questions um, during the program, um, please, you know, go ahead and put those um, in the chat here. Um, and I'll be keeping an eye out for those. So we'll uh, address any questions that you have towards the end of the hour, but please go ahead and type them in as you think of things. We'd love to hear what's on your mind. Um, so I did also want to recognize my co-curator for the exhibition, and her name is Donning Pollen Shorty. She's of Taos Pueblo, Diné, and Lakota heritage. Um, and so she's a figurative artist working in Micaceous Clay. She's also an IAIA alumna from the Museum Studies Program. And she's an arts educator at Vista Grande High School here in Taos. Uh, she comes from a family of artists. Um, she couldn't be with us tonight, um, but she will be with us at the next programs. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce Heidi Brandau. So Heidi is of Diné and Kanaka Maoli heritage. Uh, her creative practice is process oriented and it's driven by her insatiable curiosity and sincere enthusiasm for exploration. She works in mixed media paintings and social, pro social practice projects. And Brandau is a co-founder of the Harvard Indigenous Design Collective, an organization that recognizes and promotes design by and for indigenous communities as foundational to the history, theory, and practice of design fields. Brandau received her undergraduate degree from the Institute of American Indian Arts, and she studied industrial design at the Istanbul Technical University and received a master's degree at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. So welcome, Heidi. 
And Jason Garcia is from and currently lives at Santa Clara Pueblo. He's a ceramic artist and also a printmaker. His parents are John Garcia of Santa Clara Pueblo and also Gloria Garcia, um, both artists. And he comes from a long line of pottery makers in his family. Um, Garcia earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography from the University of New Mexico, and he graduated with a Master of Fine Arts in Printmaking from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Garcia has held residencies with Chaco Culture National Historic Park and the School for Advanced Research, and he was also an Artist and Business Leadership Fellow with the First Peoples Fund. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. And Ian Kuali, he's a multidisciplinary multi self-taught artist of Hawaiian and Apache ancestry, working in murals, large-scale hand-cut paper, and site-specific installations. Uh, Kuali has had a studio practice in Santa Fe, New Mexico for the last few years, and his career spans over two decades. His work has been featured in Winona LaDuke's Art of Indigenous Resistance, Urban Art Biennale 2017, Art Basel Miami, Smithsonian MMA, NMAI, Moniker Art Fair UK, um, as well as the Heard Museum. And Quali has participated in residencies and fellowships with institutions such as the Red Bull House of Art, the Young Museum, the Hawaii State Foundation, and the School for Advanced Research. Welcome, Ian. Thank you. Great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen here um, so we can go ahead and kind of get a roundtable started and hear more about your work. Um, so let me go ahead and get that going. Okay. Okay. Um, so starting with Heidi, I was just wondering, um, can each of you talk about the themes of your work in the exhibition and the ways that your medium is deliberate in its use? Sure. So in this particular series, um, so a lot of the work that I do is it's essentially built upon the same mediums, uh, which is wood and plaster. Um, acrylic graphite. Um, uh, in this particular series, I didn't use um, many printed materials, but sometimes you'll see me using those materials um, in addition to everything I just listed. Um, but for this particular series, I was really curious about um, this concept of like departures or departing. Um, I had just finished a residency at uh, the U Cross Foundation and um, I think at that point in my life, like there was a lot of sort of transition happening and also new things. Um, uh, but also I think it was a really um, impactful period in the sense that I wanted to sort of go back to sort of more like foundational elements of um, making work. Um, and for me that went back to like figure, figure drawing and sort of, um, you know, re-looking again at um, uh, line and line work. And uh, so, yeah, just trying to incorporate a lot of those kind of foundational things. And um, so, of course, like, you know, there's like uh, these gestural figures um, in addition to what could be, um, you know, sort of representative of bones. But I like to make it clear that these aren't necessarily those bones, if you will, are not necessarily associated with the human form. Um, but um, yeah, so, uh, so essentially the work there was really just the process of um, refamiliarizing myself with like uh, figure drawing and, and line work and, um, you know, very, being very deliberate about, um, you know, the, the way in which the, the paint was applied um, and washes and layers and, um, so yeah, that's that's part sort of the premise of the work in this particular series. Um, great, thank you, Heidi. And um, I should also specify too that um, these first few slides that we're going to see by these different artists, um, these are works that are in the exhibition currently. Um, so you can come to Taos and see these works in person uh, if you'd like to. Um, thank you, Heidi. Um, Jason, would you like to go next? Sure. <clears throat> Sorry. 
So I believe these are two, or I should say, thank you everybody. Uh, good evening and joining us this evening online, Zoom. Um, the two images are two uh, pieces that are in the exhibition right now. One is a um, hand processed clay tile um, painted with mineral pigments and then uh, fired traditionally outdoors. And then the other is a seriograph or silkscreen print. Um, it's about 11 to 14 colors. Uh, this is part of the work that I did uh, with my MFA work at uh, University of Wisconsin. And um, it was part of a seven uh, suite or a seven print suite that was um, illustrated in the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. So I had different um, uh, images that were uh, illustrative of, of the, um, the events leading up to and, and surrounding the Pueblo, uh, Pueblo Revolt of 1680 here in New Mexico. And then also uh, parts of it showed uh, Arizona as well too. Um, <clears throat> I think in terms of like themes, I would say the theme of my work is pretty much um, documenting the ever-changing cultural landscape of Santa Clara Pueblo, Capo uh, Winge, which is um, uh, one of six Tewa Pueblos located in New Mexico. Then there's also a, uh, another one located at uh, Hopi First Mesa, uh, part of the group that moved out after the Pueblo revolt from the Galisteo Basin area, and then also uh, just um, uh, west or east of Santa Clara Pueblo, there's, they, they had uh, migrated to Arizona around 1700. Um, so a, a lot of my work is also based on um, historical events, uh, cultural events, migration stories, and then just using the um, illustrative, um, I guess you would say comic book, graphic novel, graphic illustration. Um, yeah, so the, the, the entire suite is actually in the exhibition, so that's kind of nice to be able to, to see the entire suite of the prints. Um, I think they've only been shown locally about three or so other venues here in New Mexico since I completed the work in 2016. So I invite everybody to go in and check it out and tell. So thank you. Um, thank you so much, Jason. Yeah, we're really mm -hmm. honored to show everyone's work here. And um, mm -hmm. I'm really glad that we were able to feature all seven um, so people can see the series. Mm -hmm. um, cool. um, so let me go ahead and get to the, the next slide here. Um, Ian, would you like to talk about these works in the exhibition? Uh, most definitely. Um, Aloha, my kako. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, the, these are part of the kind of like smaller key series that I produced specifically for um, this exhibition. Um, and the idea is just to continue with sort of what I've been doing, which is uh, embedding our deities um, from Polynesia, in particular Hawaii, um, in spaces where they typically, you know, would not be. Um, and these are all rendered using just a standard 11, uh, number 11 exacto blade, um, hand cut paper with a painted verso. So when they're up against the wall, you get a little um, illuminated background um, to create that contrast. Um, but also, I mean, I think originally the, the concept was to do um, like a series of portraits of strong um, wahine or female um, Hawaiian po political leaders, um, but we had just had a passing of um, one of our most revered, so I felt like I kind of needed to hold back a bit and then, you know, sort of just bring our deities forth instead um, to kind of cleanse some space and, and put them in there before going into the series um, that I'm currently working on, which these two pieces are part of. Um, and they will be part of um, a series of, of large-scale portraits that um, our, our uh, Native Hawaiian political leaders throughout um, our history. So um, yeah, the next ones will be um, the Trask sisters um, that I work on. Um, but yeah, with these pieces, you know, I just basically just wanted to sort of bring our deities front and center and, you know, let people have that sort of discussion. 
um, around them. Uh, because typically when people see like, say like the image to the right, the image of Ku, who with protocol right now actually should be covered. Um, uh, you know, people will typically look at that image and think the basics, right? Like God of War or, you know, corny ashtray or tiki mug, right? So um, yeah, the idea was to kind of bring them, bring them forward and, you know, possibly have people discuss, um, you know, our religion and spiritual practices. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, I think, I think all of these works really, you know, give imagery to the audiences that, you know, it's individual to your practices. And I, I think that it's a way for you all to talk about individual identity, but also these, these bigger themes, you know, these bigger parts of your lives, these bigger influences too. Um, and we've had a great response to the exhibition, a uh, lot of visitors through the museum. Um, so I definitely encourage everyone to come out if you can and, um, you know, come see these works in person. Um, so let me go ahead and segue into kind of what we were talking about for this topic today. Um, so I just pulled together a few, you know, comic and animation influences just because all three of you are so deeply rooted in illustration and really so much with the body, so much with the figure. And I think scale plays a big role um, as well in your work. Um, I was wondering if you all would like to comment on any of these influences. And um, I know there's probably uh, other influences too, but just kind of comics in general and if any of these are, are some that, that you all look to. I mean, personally, um... Yeah, I grew up collecting comic books, so um, unfortunately I don't any longer, just didn't have the space to keep them. And when my mother finished school at um, UC Irvine, um, I basically had to sell my comic book collection, which in hindsight, I'm like, I probably should have sold like maybe one or two of the most valuable ones and kept the rest of the collection and shipped it over with me. Um, but yeah, I think like pretty similar to like Jason Garcia. Um, I'm not sure about Heidi, but um, I've heard Jason um, speak about like Jack Kirby influence and, you know, I love like Mobius and, you know, a lot of the early sort of underground comic uh, people, like one of my good friends, Mark Bodie, his father was Von Bodie, who was part of the whole Zap Comics crew, um, you know, like friends with like R. Crumb and Mobius and all of them. And uh, I kind of came up in an era too where like uh, Jim Lee was a huge like just the line quality of Jim Lee's work, um, yeah, resonated with me deeply. So um, as far as like the other individuals, I mean, Tim Burton, incredible, right? Um, always, but yeah. Um, thanks, yeah. Um, and Heidi or Jason, uh, what are your thoughts on kind of popular culture, animation and comic books in, in terms of your practices? Um, so I can't say that I was like a comic book collector at all. Uh, of course, I, um, you know, was interested in them. But I think in terms of like illustration broadly, um, I think a lot of I was very much influenced by a lot of old school um, Japanese illustration and also just like general like product design um, growing up in Hawaii. Um, there's such a strong um, Japanese influence uh, in everything. So it's on like your candy wrappers, it's on like your soda can, whatever. Um, and so I think being in that environment um, really drew me toward, uh, you know, enjoying and liking and appreciating the Japanese aesthetic. Um, and so I think that those, that period in my life definitely left a huge impression in terms of, you know, the style of illustration that I was drawn to. I think you can sort of see that in some of the more illustrative or monsters, if you will, that I, um, you know, create and a lot of the paintings and work that I do. Um, but uh, yeah, I think just broadly speaking that definitely um, I've been influenced by uh, a lot of um, Japanese uh, illustrators and, and designers. 
Yeah, yeah. and then for myself, in terms of, um, <clears throat> I know usually I speak pretty often about the influence of comic books and graphic novels on my own work. And um, you can clearly see, you know, I'm pulling from Conan the Barbarian and Avengers and Captain America, Hawkeye, and then also um, Los Brothers Hernandez, uh, Jaime and Gilbert Beto are like some main um, influence in terms of Love and Rockets and uh, Tales of Palomar of that being um, really influential on the work. And uh, film, film has a lot to do with it as well too. Um, uh, so pop culture in terms of movies and, and uh, Star Wars and, you know, the whole science fiction genre and all that. And then even on my bookshelf, you know, talking about like three, three shelves of just graphic novels and uh, other comic books and, um, and just kind of seeing what others are doing. And fortunately, I had the privilege and honor of being mentored and then also uh, one of my um, committee members from a Master of Fine Arts degree was uh, Linda Berry, and uh, she's a graphic novelist, cartoon creator. Um, so I was able to um, work with her and and work on different ideas. And you know, she also helped me um, um, think about how using storytelling and and uh, how stories are told in my work and 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 um, using some some ideas and and writing stories and. You know, eventually that'll lead to the um, Kawa Tells of Suspense comic book. So it's still a work in progress, but everybody's asking about it. So it'll get there. It'll be there. It's forthcoming. I request a signed copy. Okay, sounds good. I think I might need a GoFundMe and <laughs> get some money for printing. <laughs> Yeah, keep us posted. Yeah, if we can mm -hmm. do any like book signings with those, that'd be really, really fun. Um, well, great. Well, thanks so much for sharing um, about those influences. Um, I thought that now we'd kind of turn to some background uh, with each of you, just looking at some <clears throat> other work that's not in the show. Um, so let's see. So um, Heidi, um, what are your thoughts on the ways that these work inter works intersect and kind of um, how they've, you know, helped you grow in your practice. Um, I mean, I guess like always, I think at the heart of everything that I do, um, I'm, I consider myself a, a drawer <laughs> and uh, at one point a reluctant painter um, and um, always just trying to create work that I think, um, uh, going back to your earlier question, sort of um, combines this like experience of, of being in this world, right? And being exposed to so many different mediums, like pop culture. And, um, and so I think that a lot of the patterning that I do, especially in, in paintings like the one on the right, um, are sort of allude to this idea of you know, combining all of these different experiences or these mediums. Um, and, it, and in some cases, I do use uh, prints uh, or images that I had collected from different travels or experiences or sort of mementos, if you will, to sort of embed into the, the messaging or sort of the sequencing of, of how I uh, create these layers of, of patterns. Um, so, I mean, I guess if I were to talk about how these all sort of relate, I mean, at the very base, at the core of it, you know, there's like this um, uh, continuous like drawing element, the use of pattern making, um, and in the text behind the monster, of course, uh, again, just using the text as a way to uh, create these patterns. The, the, the one in the center, um, that was a series of work that I had done as part of my senior project or my sort of capstone project, if you will, when I was a student at IAIA. And at the time I had just finished um, studying uh, industrial design in Istanbul. And so I was very much interested in sort of um, diagrams and uh, the way in which we understand the, the um, um, uh, materials and products around us and even maybe perhaps the way that we communicate sort of information 
um, through these diagrams um, based upon that experience of, of um, you know, being schooled out there. And so that series was entirely based on sort of, you know, looking at these diagrams and kind of like um, understanding, you know, the way in which we convey information. So again, though, like, I think at the base or at the core of that is, um, you know, this like uh, drawing element and, and um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you want me to go any further on that, but uh, just right off the top, I think those are the things that definitely I can um, say are the parallels. Can you talk a little bit about the fragments, the, the way, like, like in this painting on the right and the paintings that are in the show, like that technique that you're using? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I feel like this is kind of how things are in a lot of instances, right? Like we don't necessarily have all the information we are, and especially now being exposed to so many different platforms all the time that we only get bits and pieces. Um, and so even the way that we understand stuff in our head are basically just like fragments of information. And so I try to convey that, or I think this is something that I'm very much interested in or curious about is sort of um, creating these layers of information. Um, so you're not gonna get in the entirety of everything, um, you know, like in maybe a traditional painting format. Um, and, and, but that's all intentional because I feel like that's the way that we sort of store things in our mind. And, and that's possibly also the way that we experience things in, in a larger uh, scale. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for uh, going further with that. The other thing too, if I might add one more, one more thing too, is just that um, uh, when I started to create these layers or these like fragments of information, um, I was also uh, a student of um, Jeff Kahn, who was a professor that had passed in um, March of this year. And, um, you know, he was a friend and a mentor and constant, um, and also, uh, you know, that relationship began because he was my professor. And I think by working with him, um, I really was drawn to this idea of also sort of, um, you know, incorporating these different lines um, into the work that I was doing. I, of course, know that I could never uh, uh, be as uh, skilled as he was in achieving, you know, the, the way that he approached the work that he did. Um, but definitely, I'd have to add that Jeff was uh, definitely a huge influence on the work that I did and continue to pursue. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. And you can kind of see that too with um, some of the geometry that you use here. And, and also, I think your, your colors too. Um, Jason, do you want to talk about these works and um, intersections, just kind of how things are developing with your, your different series that you work on? Mm -hmm. I think... Um... I think in terms of the work, uh, these three are um, <clears throat> uh, three different clay tiles. Um, I would say the one in the middle is probably earlier, like 2013-ish, uh, 12-ish maybe. And then the other two are, are a little bit later creations. Um, that I guess I can go from like left to right or however. Well, the two the two larger ones are actually, in a sense, more of the Tewa Tales of Suspense theme where I'm using historical stories or oral traditional stories about um, past events or, or past stories. And um, the uh, Tewa Tales of Suspense, number 34, uh, March 1694 siege at Black Mesa is um, representing the um, return of the Vargas um, after the Pueblo revolt. The uh, Spanish people have been chased out for a period of 12 years, and the Vargas came back to the uh, to New Mexico uh, area, the New World, I guess you would say, and um, 1694. Uh, two years after the revolt, there was another, or two years after their return, there was another revolt. 
uh, 1694 and 1696 as well. Um, and this one happened at Black Mesa, which is a um, uh, sacred ancestral landmark that's um, boundary marker that's between San Ildefonso and Santa Clara. And um, uh, the Vargas had forced about six, six plus Tewa villages and they sought refuge up on, on Black Mesa. And um, so he, he tried attempting a, a siege of the Mesa and was unsuccessful. And um, so I had created the piece, you know, based on historical records, writings, oral history. And um, about maybe four or five years ago, I had the privilege of going up with um, uh, Dr. Joseph Woody Aguilar. And uh, he's a um, archeologist from San Defonso Pueblo. And so he did his uh, doctoral work there. And so we were able to go, he showed me the areas of, of where the siege took place. So it was pretty amazing to see, you know, the uh, defensive walls and, and ammo cache. And um, so a lot of the work was, sometimes the work is created before I actually visit the site. And then sometimes I've actually visited the, the sites and then that inspired the work. Um, I've also visited several Pueblos, old Tewa ancestral Pueblos in the Galisteo Basin. And there's some that still have the churches that are remaining from, from that time period. And then also uh, working with, with archeologists, been able to um, see, I guess, I don't know if you would, remnants, I guess you would say. Um, there's a couple bells, destroyed bells from the, um, uh, village at uh, Kujamuge, which is uh, Kuyomunge, which is across from uh, Buffalo Thunder Resort. So able to sing, see those, those, um, those, I don't know, I guess you could say relics in a sense of, of, of those broken bells from those churches in that time period is, is pretty amazing. And um, so, you know, that's kind of where a lot of that, that intersects as far as um, history and oral history tales and um, um, visiting the, the sites and things. Um, and then also just observations is, is part of that, which is in both work, you know, the, the corn maiden in the middle is, is the um, observation of the young lady making a phone call. Maybe she left something at home um, and she's calling her parents to say, hey, can you bring me my earrings, my necklace, whatever, my bracelet. I left my bracelet at home. And then also observations of time periods, how time technology changes. You know, she's got the old uh, flip phone in her hand versus like now we got iPhones. And and um, so that that's part of, of that, the um, uh, technology influence on, on Pueblo people, Pueblo life. And then still retaining that our, our ancestral cultural life ways and traditions and iconography with the um, rain cloud, which I commonly use in, in most of, if not all, but most of my work. So that always um, makes an appearance in the work. And um, so, so it, it, it relates to that. I know time's a factor also, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, these are amazing works, though, too, and I, I'm really interested in how you started the Tewa Tales of Suspense in the clay panel, and you made this jump um, to have this, the sequence of seven in prints. Um, can you talk about kind of how that happened and where you're at with that? Um, I would say Tewa Tales of Suspense, again, comes from my early years of being a kid and going to the barber shop, getting a haircut, and then going to the uh, grocery store that was next door and looking at comics or uh, reading comics with my brother and my godbrothers. Um, and, and I often talk about that and, and my godbrother will affirm, or my godbrothers affirm it. Uh, my god, one of my godbrothers being uh, Tony Chavarria of, of Museum in Indian Arts and Culture. So, you know, uh, my brother and older brother and, and and Tony and Dino were, were pretty close. So I was always um, around them. And, the, you know, you see the influences of comic books of what they're reading. And, you know, maybe I'm reading uh, stuff like G.I. Joe or, or um, um, 
maybe more movie comics, but they're reading more older stuff, or maybe they're into Spider-Man and X-Men, and and um, then you start seeing different artists, and um, so that that's kind of just all that that that's fed fed to me. That's just coming in, <laughs> and then movies as well too: Star Wars, Indiana Jones, all the George Lucas. Um, uh, Spielberg stuff, action, Superman, Flash, Gordon. Um, and then uh, part of that is also working for Santa Clara Pueblo, uh, 2002 to 2007, and working in cultural resources. So going to those um, ancestral sites and seeing places where history is taking place, um, being um, so being observant, but then also wanting to tell that story of what happened in our past and using graphic illustration to teach myself, but then also my own kids and then youth, Pueblo youth. And, and now I see it as, you know, 2007 was the first Tewa Tells the Suspense that I had created um, while I was at the School for Advanced or School for America uh, School for Advanced Research in uh, 2007, I was a Dubin Fellow, so that's kind of where the first um, Tewa Tells the Suspense work started, kind of growing from there. So it's it's always been a blend of of graphic illustration, whether it's on paper, clay tiles, um, uh, uh, prints, pottery. So there's always the overlap of, of, of those stories and, and mediums and um, they appear on all, all different sorts of things. Uh, some influences, again, my own uh, poly, polychrome, um, I guess you would say heritage or, or uh, family, you know, again, family, both maternal and, and paternal uh, families are all potters, you know, going back since time immemorial, essentially, but uh, some family members being more known for their polychrome, uh, Layla and Van Uteris, and um, and then also my uh, uh, maternal aunt, Lois uh, Guterres de la Cruz, and then uh, my godbrother, Juan de la Cruz, also, who's doing some amazing things in polychrome as well, too. And then you look at the members, stories of you know, hunting stories, fishing stories, uh, fertility, all, all of that. So there's there's all influence that's just kind of building on on everything that's gotten me to, I guess you would say, where I'm at right now. So, um, thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we do have some of your relatives' work um, on view at the museum, um, some of mm -hmm. your relatives from the Gutierrez family. Um, so if people come to the museum, they'll see um, some of your family members' uh, vessels too. Um, Ian, do you want to talk about these works a little bit further in depth? Um, sure. Um, so I guess we'll start with the oldest of the works, which is in the middle. Um, yeah, I forget exactly what year it was created, but um, it was in an exhibition at the Highline Gallery, I believe is what it's called, um, in New York City, uh, Lenape Hokin. Um, yeah, and it was part of an um, a exhibition of like street art, graffiti, uh, urban contemporary art, um, which, yeah, the lineup was unbelievable. but. Yeah, this piece was huge. I forget exactly how large it was. I mean, maybe not huge, huge, but maybe like six by four, somewhere around there, maybe a little bit larger. Um, it's all hand cut paper, like the white, and then it's, uh, you know, combination of uh, paper, plaster, stolen street level billboards from New York, ink, aerosol, um, house paint. Um, yeah, and it's just kind of like, you know, being in that urban setting and just sort of trying to embed certain information um, kind of goes back to like what um, Heidi was saying about like the fragmented individual. Um, yeah, it's like something that I've been doing for like a while. And even with our Hawaiian culture, like Kauna, like building layers of information upon layers of information. So like one thing spoken or done may have four to five different meanings behind it. Um, this piece was actually a dedication to a soldier friend of mine that died in Afghanistan. So like his um, graffiti name, uh, Sher, or Sher Shot, and his um, uh, more cursive style is at the very top. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, that was an incredible show. Um, I got to meet some wonderful individuals at that time. Uh, Michael Holman, who was in the original band with Jean-Michel Basquiat um, uh, called Gray. Um, uh, Shepard Ferry was, had a bunch of work in the show. Was it Shepard Ferry? Anyway, it was like an incredible lineup. Um, so yeah, it's all on wood panel, which was actually, I worked on three different wooden panels and then kind of cut them at certain points and then reconfigured them and then threw the cut paper on the face of it. Um, and again, it's all like just a large sheet of like one sheet of paper um, and then rendered with a, a standard number 11 exacto blade. Um, and then I guess we'll go to the one that's on the left um, and going back to, um, you know, the idea of sort of embedding information and, and, and Kalma into like, you know, my work as a native Hawaiian as, you know, Kanaka. So um, this is of Kumuhina, which is sort of fitting that we have this now being that it's Trans Awareness Day, right? Or week. Um, and so, or Trans Awareness Forever. Um, so they are like one of our treasured Mahu um, cultural practitioners, native speaker, um, award-winning um, producer, and I believe director for uh, animation, um, but also super outspoken when it comes to things as, uh, such as protecting our Ibi Kapuna, which is our ancestral bones, um, and our sacred Mauna Awakea. And so this piece was the dedication hand cut paper um, piece, which was in an exhibition at Foreman Concept. And I believe that was 2016. Was that where Jason and I, were, we were talking about it a little bit earlier um, for the Broken Boxes exhibition. And so in this, you know, there's like different um, types of imagery that are sort of again, fragmented, um, you know, uh, a lauhala pattern, which is about like, you know, bringing community together, um, also, you know, mountain symbolism, and then also um, the melody that, or song that they composed is, um, that's what all of the words are um, on Kumuhina. So yeah, I just, you know, for me, I wanted to um, honor them and honor the work that they do and honor um, our to get togetherness of the Lahui or like, you know, people, uh, community. Um, and, uh, and our sacred mountain, you know. Um, and then on the right-hand side is part of an ongoing series that I'm, I'm about to work on the next um, piece in the series called Monument Pillar, um, which is sort of leaning into the idea of um, like who, who, who should be represented, especially on like our ancestral homelands, right? Um, and it, this is just basic language. So on one side, we have, you know, uh, King Kamehameha III, um, upright, strong, sort of like, you know, bold. Um, and then, you know, in basic visual language, just Captain James Cook inverted, right? Um, and again, to like sort of hopefully activate people's minds to have that conversation of such things. Like, why should there be um, so many prominent um, bronze statues of individuals who essentially decimated our people, right? And um, why can't we just, you know, <laughs> have our people represented? So um, the next one I'm doing um, is around the conversation of uh, President McKinley. And um, there's been a conversation for going on for decades about um, McKinley High School um, you know, being renamed to its original high school name, which I, f I forget exactly what it was. I think it might've been like Queen Lilo Kalani, like high school or something. I forget exactly what it was, but um, yeah. And then there's just a giant um, bronze statue of him in front of, you know, um, in front of the high school. And he was basically the president that, you know, denied our monarchy and our sovereignty. So um, yeah, the next one I do is gonna be the same thing, sort of just basic visual language, the McKinley statue off to the side. It'll be pretty large scale as well, maybe like a, another four foot by six foot piece, maybe a little bit bigger, um, all hand cut paper. And then it'll be, um, it'll basically be like um, by education or by sphere tip um, will be sort of the visual cut through 
the statue. So the, the statue will have like one portion of it higher than the other, and then our symbolism will cut through him. Um, and so, yeah, again, like trying to have that basic conversation about, um, about us as a people and like, where do we stand? And is it gonna be education or that, that shifts things? Like, you know, more of our people getting PhDs, you know, like Heidi going to, Heidi going to Harvard, you know what I mean? Like, incredible. Um, or, you know, is it gonna take, is it gonna take more? you know, you know, um, so yeah, um, those two pieces on the right-hand side were actually created specifically for, um, the larger than memory, um, exhibition at the Herd Museum, uh, and I hand cut them, like, monumental scale in the archways. They were, I believe they were, like, 20, I don't know, like, 26 or 29 feet in height by, uh, 12 feet wide. And um, I actually have a pretty, pretty fun um, time lapse that they shot, but um, Felicia Garcia and I like sat down and edited and had my brother Matt do some, some musical work to it and had one of our revered chanters like, you know, um, on the recording as well. So yeah, it was a beautiful experience. But I have the, um, these actual, like the original mock-ups are only, I don't know, like three feet in height by, I don't know, 18, maybe 19 inches wide or something. And um, these were in vinyl, right? For the Larger the Memory show? The, um, the, the ones that were in the archway because of my process, um, if I was to do it in hand cut paper, um, I would have to use some sort of spray adhesive. And as we know, propellants and museums are typically a no-no. Um, so, you know, using any kind of like aerosol in general is super frowned upon. And, you know, that much spray adhesive would have just left a sticky mess in, yeah, the space. So um, we opted for um, them to be, um, my mock-ups to be done up in vinyl and then just take the lift up and down and, and cut them out yeah, directly on the wall. So it's a whole other sort of like process that, um, that I've done before, but like haven't done and yeah, that large. Wow, so, so is it that you put um, like full sheets of black vinyl in the archways and then go in and, and start doing the details? No, so basically um, like what you would do to get the contrast is typically again with like my works, it would be, um, you know, like a, the, the back of the paper now would be a, like painted, the verso would be painted and then I would cut and then you would get that contrast. Um, but with this process it was you paint the wall a certain color and then you lay up just the white vinyl and then you cut the whatever needs to be removed and then the contrast yeah. so pretty similar to kind of what you see with the kumuhina piece um where you can kind of see the drop shadow it's like that one's floating it's up off the wall um but the 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 hand cut vinyl pieces that i did in the archways at the herb museum were like directly directly up against the wall. So you wouldn't get any drop shadow or, or anything else. Yeah. Wow, thank you. Thank you, those mm -hmm. are good insights on your work. And um, it looks like we do have um, one question. If anyone has questions, please um, go ahead and type those in and you know, we'd love to, we'd love to hear from you. And please don't talking. direct any questions towards me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so let's see. So this question um, is from Norma Schaefer, and it's for Jason. And so she's wondering, um, on the slide with Tewa Tales, the illustration on the right depicts a powerful woman in the image of a popular culture superhero. What are you intending to communicate through this woman? Can we share that slide on screen? We mind? sure can. Yeah, let me let me get back to to that one. Yeah. Oh. Or, oh, this is it. Actually, I think mm -hmm. this is what she was talking about. So this will work. Yeah. So in terms of like, um, so that one is, I guess you would say, part of that tape or part of my uh, tape. What tells us suspense. So this one's. Uh, the illustration is depicting, um, like I guess you would say, an old, an old story of long days of yesteryear, I guess. 
And um, so basically um, the men of the village were out tending to their fields. The enemies came and the ladies were getting ready in the morning, you know, getting their hair fixed, all of that. And um, when their enemies attacked the village, the women picked up their brothers, fathers, um, uncles, um, arms, weapons, and then, you know, chased, chased away, disposed of their enemy. So that, that's what the story is actually referencing. But then, um, I mean, you can also represent, it also reflects Amazonians, Wonder Woman, um, but then also references, um, uh, there are still women's societies in the Pueblos that have represent like warfare or, or have kept certain things relating to that. So that's also a reference to that. But then also a reference to um, uh, women's strength and Wonder Woman and, um, you know, all, all of that. So that, that and then just w women's power and uh, roles that certain women have and currently i mean um we're when um ian mentioned uh heidi being at harvard you also think of like deb holland of her being interior secretary so you know just just women in in various roles like that so that that's what the piece references in terms of the question i was looking for the question yeah mm -hmm. yeah and then also, you know, showing, you know, my daughters and, you know, nieces and, and that, you know, they're strong women to look up to. Uh, thank you. Thanks mm -hmm. for the question, too. Um, so we've got a couple more um, questions in here. Um, so a um, person in the audience asks, and this could be for any of you, um, are there artworks that you keep to yourself? So like works that we create and just not sell or not exist or I mean that sounds uh, like yeah if you, maybe you make work and then you decide that you need to to keep it or or maybe even if you're making work just with no intention to sell it at all or I mean I like I, I do have uh, quite a few pieces that I've created you know but I consider them just like hanging out in the inventory until the right time um Plus I have abandonment issues. So I'm like, <laughs> you know, like I don't want to abandon my work. Um, yeah, I mean, I do, I do keep um, some things, but I'm also an art collector. So, um, you know, I, I, I always stress that it's like super important to, uh, for myself personally, when I make X amount of money to put X amount of money off to the side so I can acquire, you know, works as well. I think it's important for creators to also support other creators and, and um, you know, purchase things for the future. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, the, those two pieces um, there from the Monument Pillar um, series, I still have those here, um, you know, rolled up in a tube, waiting um, for the right opportunity, whatever, yeah. Um, Jason or Heidi, do you have any thoughts on artworks that stay in your personal collection? Well, um, there's like maybe just a handful that I keep for myself. Like, of course, I have tons of drawings, you know, and uh, maybe things that I've worked on in school, like a bunch of prints. And, um, so stuff that is sort of I think foundational that, that influence kind of the work that we see like in exhibition spaces and so forth. Definitely like, you know, I have a, a cache of all of those items, but in terms of like work that I make, uh, maybe with the, with, the, with the idea of having it shown, there are some pieces of course that like I've made, especially in the last like couple years, I think that were really um, meaningful. And so therefore I just kept them. <laughs> I'm not opposed to like making maybe a copy of it that could show uh, in a public setting. But um, yeah, I think like I learned the hard way. I remember um, there was a painting that I worked on a long time ago, like 
2002. And um, a lot of those works actually were really um, like, uh, they just came from such a good place. And anyway, one in particular was uh, the guy, Jason, he owns uh, Counterculture. Um, he ended up buying that piece. And I remember being excited, but I remember just like crying mm -hmm. and being so sad. And <laughs> it was like I was getting, losing a, a loved one, you know? And so because of that, I think when I have that feeling towards a particular piece, um, I'll just save it. I'll keep it, you know? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I just when you had asked that question, I had gotten up and uh, I picked up this little piece that was on the, um, I don't know if you can see it. So I guess in the sense of saying where you keep pieces for yourself, usually potters, if they have like a crack or something, they'll usually keep it or give it away. And like, I, there's like two pots that you can see in the background. There's like one that's broken that I think one of my aunts, it cracked. And so they gave us this one. This one's another one that I got from another collector, but um so this is the one that was actually supposed to be in the show, but she got a really small hairline crack. I don't even know if you can even see it. It's like I'll, I'll take like, it. I'll take it. Yeah. Off. So I'll that that yes. didn't make it in the show. So, <laughs> but it's always nice to have something of your work, you know, in your house and show. And then, uh, as a printmaker, um, I usually try at least keep one print from each of the editions for the studio. Sometimes I'll say, like, I'll keep the one of, of whatever the edition is. But, you know, I usually at least pull either one to three um, prints from each edition and then save it for the studio and then also for my um, kids as well, too. So, yeah, so I same way, like, mm -hmm. every, every print that I've ever um, had done for me, I've, I've always kept at least one artist mm -hmm. proof and for like my own archive and for the future as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we just have a few minutes left, but um, one thing I was wondering is maybe kind of quickly if, if each of you wanted to talk about um, how the AIR residence shaped your work, what, a little bit about that experience. I can go first, like, <laughs> so I, I was just thinking about that. I had uh, done the artist in residency in uh, October of 2016. So I had uh, received my MFA, graduated, moved back from Madison, Wisconsin in August of 2016. So, you know, I had only been home about a month and then um, it was kind of nice living in Santa Fe and working at the school. Um, I'm not too sure exactly. I, I, I'm not too sure exactly when the residency started, but I know around that time, that's when it started, about 2016. And so <clears throat> um, there was a lot that I wish I could have done more of in hindsight, um, but, you know, it was only for one month and, you know, wasn't able to work with students. Um, I think some thoughts would be maybe longer three months, four months, six months, maybe the entire school year where the artist actually works with the students. I think we we're just kind of more like ships passing in the night. That's kind of how I felt with, with a lot of the, the students. And um, I know I like to brag about my um, printmaking um, department, University of Wisconsin. Um, we're number one printmaking. We beat out RISD and um, Chicago Art Institute and a couple other schools. So. Um, <clears throat> so I was kind of biased coming from, you know, number one to going to IA and um, just kind of, they need help. They need money. They need money for supplies. <laughs> they need new printing presses. Um, so I would say uh, whoever is in charge of uh, getting money for the school, I think that'd be a great idea to, to get new facility or new new equipment let's just say that so you know um that was my thought but I enjoyed it I made about two or three editions of prints um but it was just nice being in Santa Fe and I wouldn't mind doing it again I know uh you have to apply 
I don't know if they allow artists to go back in. I think if you do, it'd be a media, media, medium s switch. Um, I wouldn't mind doing something animation, something filmmaking. Um, bronze metal sculpture, I think would be pretty dope too. So that was my experience. <clears throat> and then also kudos, a shout out to uh, Jerry Q and um, Luke Parnell, who were the other two artists that were working with me. Or they were also in the studios as well, too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we're at the top of the hour, but um, but Heidi and Ian, do you want to, did you want to say a couple words about your time in the residency? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess same as uh, Jason, which is that, you know, I just finished a grad program and for me, it was a, a good time to sort of synthesize a lot of the things that I had been sort of thinking about and working towards and maybe ex, uh, going in a larger scale format. Um, uh, but also, you know, to echo what Jason had just said, um, I don't think it was enough time <laughs> uh, to get a lot of things going. So I wish I could stay there uh, for a couple months, maybe even three months would be amazing. Um, but generally, I really enjoyed my time. I mean, it was nice to be back in a familiar place. I feel like I, I is, is and will always be sort of like a family for me. And um, I also didn't get a chance to really work with students, um, aside from being a guest critic uh, for their seniors that are, you know, graduating. I think that was really great. And, um, you know, I know that, uh, um you know, Laura and um, Angelica do a really good job of trying to like organize and put things together. So I'm really appreciative of, of their effort. Um, but uh, yeah, my that's my only takeaway. It was really great. It, I had a great time. I wish I had more time. Maybe I'll apply again. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I had an incredible experience um, with the artist's uh, residency. Um, got a lot of work done. Um, I made sure that I kind of challenged myself. I put myself in the fab, fab lab, like a fabrication lab. I never worked with, I don't really work with computers. Um, and, uh, you know, I really wanted to um, work with the laser cutters. So I got three laser cut editions done, um, two of like, old, well, actually two older in images. And then um, I did uh, an addition for this, um, mural organization out of Rochester, New York called Wall Therapy. And so they were doing their annual benefit and they asked if I wanted to be involved. So I created an addition for that. Um, um, I did, what else did I do? Oh, I did a lot of critique as well. Um, did a lot of studio visits um, in, in the painting studio. Um, um, Oh, I helped hang the senior exhibition. I volunteered my time to help hang the senior senior exhibition that year. Um, and oh, and Chinupa Hans Scott Luger was doing the the everyone bead project piece. So Rose Simpson was um, in the ceramics, like teaching in the ceramic studio at the time, and we would check in all the beads and then kind of sort them out according to size. And then um, when Chinupa did come back, we did all the layout behind the ceramic studio. So we. Chinup and I essentially assembled all that together, um, did all the dyeing there on the spot, um, strung them all together and a whole lot of prayer, a whole, whole, whole lot of prayer, heartbreaking prayer. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was beautiful. Um, I, I recommend it to like everybody, you know, whenever it, it pops up again, when, um, you know, there's an the open call, um, I, I usually try to repost as much as possible to, and, and encourage, I try to encourage as many, um, now that they have the NEA, um, which I was, I was the first one to do the National Endowment for the Arts one, um, it's open to, to Native Hawaiians. So um, I try to encourage as many Native Hawaiians as possible to, to apply and, um, and just some of the other residencies around here. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for your thoughts on the residency, um, it began in 2015, and I know that they just, um, I think, closed the cycle for this go around in November. There was a November date that they were accepting applications. 
Uh, but we're just so honored to feature all three of your work in the show. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for being part of the exhibition. Um, and I invite everyone to come to the museum, come to the Millicent Rogers in Taos. Um, our next Zoom program is going to be on Thursday, December 9th from 6 to 7 p.m. And it's going to feature Linda Loma Haftawa and Erica Lord. Um, so hope to see you for that. We'll send out the registration link uh, for that pretty soon. Um, thank you all. Have a great night. Mahalo, yeah, thank everyone. you all for tuning in. Mahalo, everyone.